couple years ago, we were in Maui, <clears throat> and uh, in Lahaina Town, there's a giant banyan tree. Some of, anybody ever been to Maui, Lahaina Town? You seen that giant banyan tree? And Brenda's mom and uh, her dad, Carl, were, were with us. And we're walking down the street there, and I saw this guy that just, he looked like John the Baptist. I mean, long, scraggly hair. I mean, kind of like you envision John the Baptist. Long, scraggly hair and a beard, and he's just out there under that banyan tree just thundering away with the gospel, you know. And it bugged me. Um, Admittedly, you know, not having a, an evangelistic gifting, uh, but believing that we should share our faith, but then not recognizing uh, in our culture, or recognizing in our culture that for the most part, those kinds of evangelistic efforts are not very well received. I mean, you've seen it. You know, you, you know, the, this 4th of July parade this year downtown there was a guy with a megaphone and he's out there yelling at everybody and you know it's not like we don't have a hundred churches in Coeur d'Alene or Kootenai County and that people know that there's a, a, a God and a Jesus and the Bible and the cr cross and the you know salvation and so forth so it's, sometimes to me those things are obnoxious but Brenda's mom and dad and Brenda were walking by and I said you guys just go ahead I'm gonna go talk to this guy and to be frank, I was going to go set him straight. You know, it's what's wrong with me, right? And so I walked up to this old guy, and he's got the most worn out Bible. And uh, he, uh, I mean, this thing was just beat, beat, beat up. And I'm, I walked up to him, and I said, hey, let me, let me talk to you for a minute. Because he wouldn't stop. I mean, he was going, just nonstop. And he wouldn't stop, and I said, hey, hold on, man, let me talk to you. And then he stops for a minute, looks at me, and I ask him a question, and he starts to answer the question, and immediately goes from the, the you know, like two or three verb, uh, ver uh, words verbatim directly to scripture. And he just quotes a string of scriptures to answer my question, and then goes right back to his preaching. And I said, dude, Dude, shut up and listen to me. I want to talk to you. And finally, I get this guy's attention, and I, yeah, he, he says, well, what, what do you want? And I said to him, um, what are you doing out here? And it, it, by now, I've got him talking to me. And he says, well, I was in Vietnam. And when I was in Vietnam, I got trapped in a foxhole. And I said to God, if you will get me out of this foxhole and get me home, I will dedicate myself to the preaching of the gospel for the rest of my life. All of a sudden, my tune's changing. And it, it kind of blew me away because I, by this time, he went right back to preaching. And, and I stepped back for a minute. And I was thinking. And I noticed that while he had his Bible and he was doing this with it, he wasn't looking at it. But he was quoting verbatim scripture as fast as anybody I've ever seen. He, he, and the reason that his Bible was as wiped out as it was is that guy poured over those scriptures. Now, again, let me put you back in the scenario. This guy was long, scraggly hair, dirty, half his teeth were missing, beard with, you know, probably, I don't know, yesterday's breakfast in it. I mean, I, it was just, it, it was the craziest thing I ever saw. How many of you were here a few years ago when I showed the video of that guy? A couple of you remember that, okay. Because I finally then asked him later, I said, man, does anybody ever get saved? You know, because I'm thinking, you know, everybody's here on vacation, and he's out here being obnoxious, yelling at everybody, and he says, only the people that beat me up, and then he keeps on preaching again. And I so, I mean, it's everything I can do to get him to stop and talk to me. He says, Okay, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? The only people that beat you up. And he says, well, people get upset with me for being out here doing this, and sometimes people will come and beat me up. And then afterwards, a couple days later, they'll come back and they'll apologize. And when they come back and apologize, then I 
minister to them and tell them what I'm doing and they get saved. That's an amazing story, isn't it? It's a true story. But see, this guy made a vow to God. And he decided, I'm going to keep it. And he did. But that's not common. Most people that make vows to God don't keep them. And so the Bible does give us some instruction concerning the making of vows, and it is in the last chapter of Leviticus, which is what we're studying tonight. And so as a setup for this, I have some things in my mind I want to set you uh, into uh, motion concerning, uh, and not so much the banyan tree preacher, as I call it, but um, some biblical scenarios related to the making of vows. And so let's start in this particular case in Proverbs, uh, chapter 20 and verse 25. So Proverbs 20, 25. Are you guys going to put it on the screen tonight, Shane? Outstanding. And even no, with no motion background. Somebody said that the motion kind of is uh, distracting, and so during the scriptures, they're, they're freezing that so it won't be moving around. That's nice. Yeah. Um, it is a snare for a man to devote rashly something as holy and afterward to reconsider his vows. And this is coupled together with a bunch of other scriptures about making rash vows to the Lord. Um, my version of this is under commit, over deliver. Uh, don't make promises and then don't deliver them. Don't even make the promise and then if you do something then you're still on the, the winning side. Um, and so... Uh, the, the Bible talks about this, not to make vows, uh, in particular vows to God, that you don't think through. Uh, Jesus talked about this, making vows. Uh, he, he, there are parables that relate to the making of vows. And we even know that no man goes to war except for first he weighs the cost. And so we're cautioned to be thoughtful about the decisions we make and the promises that we make and the vows that we make in, unto God in, in particular. Okay, so let's go to uh, uh, Judges for a minute. Judges chapter 11. You thought you were going to study Leviticus. And I'm going to start in verse 30, Judges chapter 11, verse 30. And Jephthah, and Jephthah was the son of a prostitute, uh, his bro, uh, Gilead, his uh, dad, and his brothers, once the brothers grew up, they kicked him out of the house. They didn't like him. You're not our dad's kid, you know, really, I mean, you're, you're not really part of our family, get out. And so he went out and he was hanging around with scoundrels most of his life and uh, it was like a gang. And they would be looting and doing all kind of crazy stuff. And yet over the process of time, Jephthah became one of the judges of Israel. And the reason that he became one of the judges is because Gilead uh, needed support with Ammon uh, and the, because there was going to be a kind of a conflict with them. And so he went and got Jephthah and said, if you'll help us, you know, that would be nice. And so uh, Jephthah decides, okay, I'm going to go back and I'll help you guys. And so Jephthah makes a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed deliver the people of Ammon into my hands. Now he's, this vow he's praying to the Lord then it will be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Now, you already got a problem here because you're thinking to yourself, what in the world is he thinking is going to come out of the door of his house? 
And of course, the assumption is, I mean, we have, you know, um, in our modern world, we kind of view things on, on a slightly different level than some uh, today, but, uh, or in, in other parts of the world in, in, in history. But in those days, it wouldn't have been uncommon for somebody to have a bunch of animals in their house, too. And a lot of times, the manger was in the bottom, in the center of the house. And so it wouldn't be uncommon, you know, how puppies might be. Uh, for, you know, oh, Jephthah's home, the little guy goes wagging his tail and runs out the front door, and he'll be the first one, and so he says, I'll sacrifice whatever runs out of the front door as a burnt offering. And so Jephthah advanced toward the people of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And he defeated them from Aror as far as Minith, 20 cities, and to Ebel Karamim, and a very great slaughter, or with a very great slaughter. Thus the people of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. Uh, when Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and dancing, and she was his only child. Because, uh, besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And so she was excited. Hey, dad's home. This is great. And she's celebrating. By now, she's heard about the victory uh, that they had had over Amnon, uh, and, uh, Ammon. And uh, uh, so she's coming out to celebrate her dad, and she's the first one out of the house. You can imagine where this is going. Uh, you talk about rash vows. And it came to pass when he saw her that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot go back on it. And so she said to him, My father, if you have given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, because the Lord has avenged you on your enemies uh, the people of Ammon. So the daughter, his only daughter, his only child, says, Dad, if you made a vow to the Lord, you're going to have to keep it. And so she encourages her dad. Well, she says um, to her father, this, let this thing be done for me. Uh, let me alone for two months, because she apparently knows what the vow is by this point. Let me alone for two months that I may go and wander on the mountains and bewail my virginity, my friends and I. In other words, let me and my friends go have two months before you kill me. Uh, let me and, and I'll bewail the fact that I have no offspring, that I'm not going to be able to carry on your name in any way, uh, and just mourn. And again, because Jephthah made this horrible vow. Uh, rashly. And so he said, go and send her away for two months. And she went with her friends and bewailed her virginity on the mountains. And it was so at the end of two months that she returned to her father and he carried out his vow with her, which he had vowed. She knew no man and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went four days each year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. Now, you talk about the Bible being a PG book. <laughs> this is tough stuff. This is an R-rated movie for sure. So Jephthah makes a vow, rashly, that he will sacrifice as a burnt offering whatever comes out the front door first, and it's his own daughter. And he fulfills his vow to the Lord. Now, the problem with this is that he made a vow to the Lord that... He shouldn't have made. God knew that. God had already made provisions in the scriptures for people that would make vows and that, that would need to recant. Because God knows our frailty. He knows our weakness. He knows our foolishness. Um, how many of you have ever made a mistake? I mean, you don't have to raise your hand, but if you've ever made a mistake, you said, man, I wish I didn't do that. Um, not all of us have made vows to the Lord that we wish we had kept, uh, because typically we don't really do too much vow making these days. Uh, the primary vow of our modern world is in marriage, when we vow to God to remain married. And uh, you see what's happening in our culture today. 
And so God has made provisions in the law uh, for this problem of making vows and going, uh uh-oh, afterwards, the rash vow. Now, it's apparent, go to Leviticus 27. It's, a, it's, it's a apparent that Jephthah didn't know the law. If he had known the law, he could have invoked the law to rescue him from this rash vow that he had made. This is what the chapter is fundamentally about, this voluntary worship of God versus the mandatory worship that everything else we've read about in Leviticus is focused on. And so the book starts with, you must, you must, you must, and it ends with, well, if you do and don't, then this. (laughs) And so there's this clause. I think it's an interesting timing, as everything to me lately seems like a timing issue with the Lord. As I'm preparing for Sunday, and I'm going to be teaching to you from the latter part of the book of Mark, the verses that I'm going to focus on are from verses 9 to 20, and most uh, biblicists that study manuscripts, uh, ancient writings, uh, the Bible, theology, soteriology, all of the above, have come up with arguments that they use to suggest that that part of the Bible doesn't actually belong in the Bible. Uh, And so some Bibles have it with a footnote and so forth, um, but say most manuscripts have this, the two most ancient don't, and so forth. And making apology for this text, I'm going to just be talking to you about that. I'll tell you about it on Sunday. However, it's interesting because this particular piece of Mark is noted by many scholars as to not belong. And the same thing happens here in Leviticus 27. In fact, if you look at the latter couple of verses of 26, it seems like that's the end of the book. It makes perfect sense. Uh, God says, for my own sake, I'm going to keep these people. I'm not going to cast them away. Uh, And then finally, the verse 46 says, these are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between himself and the children of Israel on Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. In, boom, the, the, the end. I mean, it would be a perfect ending. But, no, there's this tag on. I su- suspect and believe, just like Mark, that this belongs. And that it is added there intentionally to bring some relief for those persons that make vows unto the Lord, which are referenced in the book of Leviticus. Uh, but also in contrast to the obligatory offerings, now we're talking about volitional offerings, those things that we voluntarily give to the Lord. A lot of stuff here I'm going to read through rather quickly, and then we'll come back and make uh, probably a couple summaries. Beginning in verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man consecrates by a vow certain persons to the Lord according to your valuation, if your valuation is of a male from 20 years old to 60 years old, then your valuation shall be 50 shekels of silver. Uh, A shekel, this is the sanctuary shekel, and it is a month's wages. And so 50 months' wages would be the cost to buy back a male uh, in his prime between 20 and 60. Which gives me hope I still have three years. It is according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Verse 4, if it is a female, then your valuation shall be 30 shekels. And if from five years old up to 20 years old, then your valuation of a male shall be 20 shekels. And for a female, 10 shekels. And if from a month old up to five years old, then your valuation for a male shall be five shekels of silver. And for a female, your valuation shall be three shekels of silver. 
And if from 60 years old and above, if it is a male, then your valuation shall be 15 shekels. <laughs> it's not very fun, is it? And for a female, 10 shekels. And if he is too poor to pay your valuation, then he shall present himself before the priest, for the priest uh, shall set a value for him according to the ability of him who vowed the priest shall value him. So in other words, if the person that made a vow, like Jephthah, he says, I vow whatever comes from that door, uh, I'm going to give as a burnt offering. Had he understood and known this law, if the people during the time of the judges, which you remember, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They didn't care about the law. They weren't, they weren't sensitive to the leadership of the Lord. And so because they had missed out on the things of the law, because they were disrespecting the Lord, they also had failed to find the good in those things that God had provided for them. Not just the, the things that they thought, oh, that's going to keep us from being able to have fun, uh, but also the rescue that is provided by the godly standard that he had uh, given to them. But if the person is too poor, you know, and you say, man, I, I shouldn't have done that. If, if let's say, Jeff, that was poor, he couldn't afford, and he did know about the law, and he could have gone back and said, look, my daughter's in her prime. I want to pay 30 shekels, but I don't have 30 shekels. Uh, let me negotiate. And the priest is then able to look at the daughter and make an evaluation based on the financial stability of the home and be able to say, um, okay, well, we'll settle for five shekels or whatever it might have been. Giving the guy an opportunity to redeem what he had been, or what he had given to God in a vow. Now that's already, I mean, I know you guys, are, I can tell you, I'm looking in your faces and you're like, what the heck are we talking about? Well, let's look at Hannah. Remember Hannah? And she had a little boy named Samuel and she prayed and she prayed and she prayed and she said, God, if you will give me a son, I will give him to you. And remember after she weaned him, she nursed him for three years. She went a long time. She probably didn't want to give the boy away, right? And so finally, she takes him to Eli, the priest, and says, look, I'm committing my son to the Lord. And this, the boy, Samuel, grew up in the house of Eli in the, in the temple as a servant to the Lord. She thought through that before. She prayed for years, mumbling and, and, and seeming like she was drunk and was even at times, uh, you know, bothered uh, you know, man, what are you doing here? Why are you, what are you, what are you doing? And her husband, you know, come on, I'm better than you. How many sons? Five, wasn't it, Brent? Am I not better to you than five sons or seven sons? I can't remember. I think it was seven, maybe. And um, so she thought, had time. She really thought it through, and she made a vow, and she kept that vow. It was intentional. Uh, and so no need for redemption there. But in this event that somebody does make this rash vow, which admittedly is rare, especially with all the cautions about making vows to the Lord, uh, this clause would have been helpful. Very, very helpful. Well, it goes on. Verse 9. If it is an animal that men may bring as an offering to the Lord... All that anyone gives to the Lord shall be holy. Now, when it says shall be holy, what that means is that it, this means it's consecrated to God. It is set apart. It's sanctified. It's for no use except for the Lord. It's only for the use of the Lord. And so if it's an animal that men may bring as an offering, and I'll comment there, meaning a clean animal that could be used as a sacrificial animal to the Lord, all the, uh, that anyone gives to the Lord shall be holy. He shall not substitute it or exchange it good for bad or bad for good. And if he at all exchanges animal for animal, then both it and the one exchanged for it shall be holy. Um, remember in the book of Malachi, Malachi, um, the priests, remember, were accepting and bringing offerings to the Lord that were maimed and blind and lame. And God says, will I accept this offering from you? If you think I will, take it to your governor and see if he'll accept it, for I will not accept it, says the Lord. And he's even pointing out sarcastically to these people that are half-heartedly worshiping the Lord, 
Your governor wouldn't even accept these terrible looking things you're trying to sacrifice to me. You're giving me the worst. And so the people would have these offerings that they would bring, and they, ooh, boy, that one looks pretty nice. Now, nah, never mind. I'm going to keep that one for myself and put this ratty old thing in there. And then God says, nah, uh, you do that. Now they're both mine the good one and this ratty looking thing, uh, because you're not going to be doing that when you make these uh, offerings from a clean animal, a sacrificial animal. And by the way, there is no redemption. It's given, that's it. And God says, it's mine, uh, this offering. Now, if it's an unclean animal, which they do not offer as a sacrifice to the Lord, then he shall present the animal before the priest. And if the priest or and the priest shall set a value for it, whether it is good or bad, as uh, you and the priest value it, and so it shall be. But if he wants it all to redeem it, then he must add one fifth to your valuation. So now in this case, let's say the priest says, okay, this is an unclean animal. It's not an animal that we can use for sacrifice, but it can be useful for uh, food, or we're going to, you know, make put it to work somehow, or whatever reason he says I'm going to keep it. Okay, it's worth a shekel, and so it, it, he says it's worth a shekel. And you, so ah, I changed my mind. I don't want to give you my, you know, cat, whatever. Did they eat cat in those? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so now it's a shekel plus twenty percent. See, it tastes like chicken. You're right. Uh, we should know, we eat at Chinese restaurants. I didn't say that. <clears throat> Scratch that off the tape. Um, so the shekel plus the 20%. Now you're going to pay more than the thing is worth to get it back. So now the idea is if you're making a vow to God, it will cost you if you break your vow. And it's not just going to be an even exchange. There's going to be a penalty for breaking your vow. And how many times we have learned this? Indeed. Amen? Okay, so verse 14. And when a man dedicates his house to be holy to the Lord, in other words, he dedicates his house to the Lord, then the priest shall set a value for it, whether it is good or bad, and the priest values it, and so it shall stand. Uh, if, he if he who dedicates it wants to redeem his house, then he must add one-fifth of the money, or 20%, uh, to your valuation of it, and it shall be his. Now, that's funny, because, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times as a pastor I've had somebody call me and say, hey, Pastor Paul, can you come over to my house? I got a new house, and I want you to dedicate it to the Lord. <laughs> I don't think they know what they're saying. Uh, because a house dedicated to the Lord means that the house is no longer yours. It belongs to the Lord. And it, technically, in this case, what would happen is one of the priests would live in it or they would own it and then they would rent it out and the money from the rent would go to the temple. And so it wasn't your house anymore. You think about that next time you call me and ask me to come dedicate your house. And so, of course, it's voluntary again, if a man does this, Right? Verse 16, if a man dedicates to the Lord part of a field of his possession, then your valuation shall be according to the seed for it. A homer of barley seed shall be valued at 50 shekels of silver. And so basically you got 50 years where you'd have this field. And so he puts a value on the amount of money per homer uh, times the amount of time that they would have it. Uh, homer of seed, so that it can bring in a harvest. And so that would be the measure by which they would value it, is what can it bring back and, and unto the Lord. And so you should uh, bring uh, the homer of barley seed and shall be valued at 50 shekels of silver. And if he dedicates his field from the year of Jubilee, according to your valuation, it shall stand. Now, <clears throat> if he dedicates his field after the Jubilee... Then the priest shall reckon to him the money due according to the years that remain till the year of Jubilee, and it shall be deducted from your valuation. And if he who dedicates the field ever wishes to redeem it, then he must add one-fifth of the money of your valuation to it, and it shall belong to him. But if he does not want to redeem the field, or if he has sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed anymore. But the field shall be, 
uh, when it is released in the Jubilee shall be holy to the Lord as is a devoted field and it shall be the possession of the priest. And so if you have land and you are going to commit it to the Lord and you want to buy it back and it, it is land that would typically uh, not come back to you because it's, it was something you bought or you attained that at the year of Jubilee was going to go back to the original owner, you have X number of years that you can actually own it. And so let's say you had it for 25 years, you, you made the vow right after the Jubilee, you've had it for 25 years, now you dedicate it to the Lord, you want to get it back, you've got to pay the 25 uh, uh, times 50 shekels for the redemption of the land. And so again, extremely expensive, and again, valued on what you can gain from it. I know you're bored. Let's keep moving. Uh, and if a man dedicates to the Lord a field which he has bought, which is not the field of his possession, then the priest shall reckon to him the worth of your valuation up to the year of Jubilee, and he shall give your valuation on that day as a holy offering to the Lord. In the year of Jubilee, the field shall return to him from whom it was bought. Uh, to the one who owned it, uh, uh, owned the land as a possession, and all your valuation shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary, uh, 20 geras to the shekel. And so, again, to rehearse this again. So, look, this is yours. You bought it. You dedicated it. Uh, but it's not going to be able to stay at the, uh, in the temple, in the priest. It has to be redeemed from the Jubilee back to its original owner, and therefore you have this valuation placed in the number of years. If it was your own personal property and you vowed it to the Lord, you can never get it back, even if it's a jubilee. And so this is what uh, uh, the law had articulated for them. So now, in verse 26, but the firstborn of the animals, which should be the Lord's firstborn, no man shall dedicate. Whether it is an ox or sheep, it is the Lord's. Now, that sounds funny in English. Um, what he's saying is, you cannot give to God what is already his. In other words, you can't dedicate the firstborn. Well, because God owns the firstborn. He already said, the firstborn of the, he that openeth the womb shall be mine. And so the firstborn belongs to God, nothing you can do about it. And you can't go, well, hey, God, I'll give you this. He's like, no, you can't give me that, it's already mine. You know, it's like when Roby goes into my room, steals something from me, wraps it up, and gives it to me for Christmas, right? Um, it's never happened, but it could. And uh, that's the point. See, God is saying, no, you're not going to dedicate to me what's already mine. And if it is an unclean animal, uh, when he shall redeem it according to your valuation, and he shall add one-fifth to it, or if it is not redeemed, it shall be sold according to your valuation. So an unclean animal of the firstborn. Uh, and still in this context, with the potential of redemption, with the one-fifth or the 20%. Still going to cost you. Now, verse 28. Nevertheless, no devoted offering that a man may devote to the Lord of all that he has, both man and beast, or the field of his possession shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted offering is most holy to the Lord. It belongs to the, to the Lord. So nevertheless, no devoted offering that a man may devote to the Lord of all that he has, both man and beast, or the field of his possession shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted offering is most holy to the Lord. No person under the ban who may become doomed to destruction among men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. In other words, there is a case in which someone cannot be redeemed. And under the law, you already know this. Uh, if a man sheds a man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. Okay, uh, Adultery, homosexuality, bestiality, uh, rape, these things were all punishable by death. And so there was no redemption under the law for these people in the temporal sense. Okay, So even if they repented, and it would be right that they would, they still have to be killed. 
And if they repented, they'll go to heaven. Okay, with, in that case, they would have gone to Abraham's bosom because it's pre-cross. But the idea is that they, uh, can, be rep- they can repent and be saved, but not in the, in t- in the temporal sense of being redeemed. And so in this case, the spiritual application is, of course, there is no redemption for the man that is unredeemable, and there is no redemption offered to the man who is unrepentant, which, of course, we don't have to elaborate on for tonight, because I can still tell you're going, why did we come here today? It might be worth it before we're done. Verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the first of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. In other words, you can't dedicate that to God. So God is saying, look, you can't tell me you're doing a great thing by giving me your tithe. It's already mine. And so you can't dedicate your tithe to God. But he goes on to give you some instruction concerning the tithe and the misuse of the tithe. If a man wants at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one-fifth to it. The concer- and concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock or whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. Ten- tithe means tenth. That's where you get the word. Uh, he shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, and so forth. I'll finish that in a minute. Let me go back. So you're saying to yourself, because we live in the modern Western world, and of course we're not under the old covenant, so be careful here. Um, If you have a tithe, you think money. In the case of Israel, it would not just be money. It would be, okay, I had a harvest of wheat. It's a 10%. I had animals, 10%. Whatever it is that you gain, 10%, the first tenth, the first fruits of your offering belongs to the Lord. And so this represents the first fruit, represents the whole of the harvest, and it belongs to God. Now, we're dealing with the Old Covenant law. In the New Covenant era, if you will, which is really the millennium, but today, as Christians, Gentiles in particular, that have been grafted into the root and fatness and promises that were given to Israel, uh, they become recipients of the New Covenant, uh, then we're no longer under the law, and therefore the mandatory tithes that were required of Israel are not required in the church age. Uh, in, by the way, in the Old Testament, under the law, the tithe was 23 and one-third percent. The reason was there were t- three different kinds of tithes that everyone was supposed to give. The temple, the priesthood, and um, the poor. And so every year, they would give 20%, and on the third year, they would give an additional 10%, and so over a period of three years, it averaged out to 23 and one-third percent. But in the context, what is really being said here is that, look, if you owe God a tithe, or you you fail to give him your tithe, and you just say, well, I'm going to keep it for myself, and I'm going to use it, and I'll pay him later, uh, then you have to add 20%. Or one-fifth, because you're using what belongs to God. And he's saying, no, uh well, I don't, I'm not running the credit system here with no interest, right? And so he's telling them again, what you have offered to me, if you do not keep your commitment, it will cost you something. Now, that's important to note. We'll come back and I'll summarize some of this, and then you'll say, oh, okay, I get it. Am I perceiving you guys okay? So I'm right? Which means you have no idea what I'm talking about? (laughs) Vern's honest. He says, yeah, I don't know. Where's my snicker? (laughs) I will. Back to verse 29. Oh, you want me to go backwards. Can I finish and then I'll go back and answer the question? All right, thank you. Getting softer in your old age there, Vern. (laughs) You're our kind. Thank you, my dear friend. Um, He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad uh, for those things that pass under the rod. Okay, I'm backing up again. The way, and this is important probably to some other study. We don't have time for today, but when the shepherd separates the sheep and the goats, remember the sheep and goat judgment, Matthew 25, 
that this is the method by which a shepherd would separate his sheep and goats. He would hold out a staff and they would go underneath the, the rod or the staff and as they would go under, they would count them. One, two, three, four, five, as they would go through one at a time. And every tenth one belonged to God. Now that was in reverse of the way that everyone was supposed to give of the first fruits because it was the first 10% that belonged to God, the firstborn that belonged to God, but now it's the tenth one counted that belongs to God. And so you go, okay, nine for me, one for God. Nine for me, one for God. And in this case, you'll see, it had to be random. It couldn't be like, hey, organize that so that that creepy one's number 10. Just like the one that, you know, you tried to trade him out. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. For if he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one exchanged for it shall be holy. It shall be, uh, it shall not be redeemed. In other words, just like before, you try to trick the Lord, it's going to cost you both ways, coming and going. This, this belongs to God. This tenth one belongs to God. You're going to try to cheat God out like these guys did in Malachi, uh, and God rebuked them for it. These priests, you despise my name, and you say the table of the Lord is contemptible. Now, verse 34, last verse. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. And thus, the end of Leviticus chapter 27. Now, back to verse 29. No person under the ban who may become doomed to destruction among men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. And so, if a guy is an adulterer or a homosexual or a sodomite or a, uh, has had a sex with an animal, sorry if Kayla's in the room uh, or any other kids, uh, that, or... Uh, has been a rapist, uh, if any of this stuff has happened, if that guy had been dedicated to the Lord or not, if you decide, well, he messed up real bad, I'll dedicate him to the Lord and redeem him. No, there's no manipulating God. See, God, again, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows our hearts, and that's the whole point here. He's trying to help you see that disobedience, manipulation, and falsehood uh, you know, f fabricated vows and rash vows are unacceptable to him, but still he makes a way for man. And that's really important because how many of us are screwballs? How many of us have messed up all the time? We do things, we say things, we intend things, we don't follow through uh, the way we should, and therefore God provides redemption for us. So, Vern, um, you obviously have a question Run a mic over to him real quick, uh, and while you do, let me go on explaining it, and then I might answer it before you get to it again, and if, if so. So in this case, the person is under a ban. In other words, look, he's got the death penalty already. You can't redeem this guy. He has to die. Uh, and so there's no, there's no um, method by which this person can be redeemed in the temporal sense. And by the way, I, I, I almost thought about talking to you guys a little bit about hell tonight uh, in this context, because we have a real problem with the idea of an eternal hell and why. Uh, and maybe we'll get to it if you, if well, let me ask you your question, Vern, and then maybe we can uh, go to a couple bullets I've got here, and then we'll do that. So go ahead. Okay. If you plug in David and Uriah, David should have been killed. Yeah, a lot of people should have been killed, and they didn't. Um, they didn't kill and, David. So, what about David? Yeah, he should have they, been killed. Yeah, but they didn't kill him. I know. He lost his sons, a I, couple of them. Yeah, the consequences. That, but he God didn't pay did. the, this, he still, we're still in the, under the law. David was, and these people are. Yeah. You go back here in Joshua 7 and look at Achan. Yep. And, uh, man, they killed him and a whole bunch of his All of his people. family. Yeah, yeah, people and his animals and everything else. Yeah. For just for I, disobeying God. I, I have a problem. I, in my mind, Achan is the best soldier in the Bible. <laughs> okay. The number one. He, uh, the man's crazy enough to be a Marine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, David got away with it. He's a man after God's heart. I, I have a hard time with that one. Yeah, well, of course. Um, but let me just elaborate on that. Uh, remember the woman taken in adultery? 
and they brought her to Jesus and these religious leaders says, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. The law says that she must be put to death. What do you say? And remember, Jesus stooped down on the ground and started writing on the ground. Um, these guys weren't going to kill her, and Jesus knew it. And the reason that they weren't going to kill her was very well known to them and to Jesus, and that was they had lost their authority. The scepter had departed from Jerusalem, from Israel. They couldn't kill her. And it was not uncommon in all kinds of eras of the Old Testament that even though the law said you've got to put this guy to death for this or this gal to death for this, uh, they didn't do it. They rarely ever did uh, because of their disobedience. Now, God did, like you're talking about Achan. Uh, this was after uh, the uh, battle of uh, Jericho, and uh, he went and stole some stuff. And he hid it in his tent underneath. And then they went out to battle against I, A-I, and uh, they lost. And so Joshua prayed, what's going on? How come, you know, Lord, what's happening? How come we lost the battle? And the, guy, uh, the Lord tells him to separate the tribes, separate the families and the tribes, separate them down, and there's the guy right there. What have you done? And he and his whole family were killed. And so that was by divine mandate. Uh, you know of many other cases where God particularly killed. How about, let's talk about vows in relationship to God killing somebody. Um, Ananias and Sapphira. We'll be getting there in a few weeks in Acts. Everybody in the early church decided, hey, I got a good idea. Let's sell our houses and give all the money to the church. And, and so all these people are doing this. Now, it wasn't God told them to do it. It was voluntary. And so they said, well, um, you know, here's the money. And we lay it at the apostles' feet, and then the apostles are supposed to take care of things and deal with it as, as necessary. And uh, then all of a sudden, one day, Ananias rolls up and says, ah, here's the money from my house. And Peter says, you, is that how much you got for the house? He goes, oh, yeah, that was it. That was it. But he was lying. And God killed him right on the spot. Now, he didn't even have to give the money. It wasn't required. But he was making this false vow. He was making this pretense. God says, you're dead, man. And then his wife comes and conspires to do the same thing, not knowing that the guys that just carried his dead body out had just left the room. And then she walks, and Peter says, so how much money was it? Yeah, well, is that right? Is that how much it was? Uh-huh. Poof, she's dead too. So God killed them both to make an example out of them. So, yeah, but you're right. I mean, why, did God, why didn't God kill David? Yeah. Yeah, Dave, his, for those of you online or couldn't hear him, David was in charge. The, the other people weren't. Why, why did God allow it? We'll have to uh, examine those things in the eternal. Uh, you know, we'll know as we're known. Right now, we don't know the answers, and it, to me, is problematic. I do it a little bit, but kind of always with tongue-in-cheek, but uh, to, to be able to say, well, this is why, unless the Bible tells us, and we don't know. Uh, obviously he should have been killed and God did punish him greatly didn't allow him to build the temple killed his firstborn son which would have been uh, the, the, the prime uh, f uh, offering anyway uh, yes ma'am we need to run that mic around who's got a mic we're, we're short staffed today you guys we got kids having babies everywhere and youth groups in, in other parts of the country and such so is that okay is there somebody back in there still okay All right. yeah we're fine Okay, good. Yes. And then I got a couple of summary points I want to cover before we're done. So. Okay, well, with this verse, okay, and what we're talking about, it's saying that under the ban, who may become doomed to destruction. So if I take this, and let's say I have a child who has committed murder, and he's now on trial, and they have sentenced him to death. According to this, I can't go and pay for him to be redeemed. Exactly. Because he was already sentenced. It, but it says, who may be. It, exactly. David never was. David never was. Well, yeah, there's a. It, so, also, David wasn't vowed to the Lord. So we're just right. using some questions that are right. kind of so, semi related. But. So, with this, it doesn't, it, it, it actually, to me, doesn't apply because this is. For David, are you saying no. that. 
No, my me is not. You're, are you saying it doesn't apply to David? It doesn't apply to David in You're the right. sense that nobody... Because he wasn't vowed to the Lord. Right, and there wasn't, yeah. and nobody was, he wasn't on, you know, he hadn't been condemned to death. Nobody yeah. had done that. Now, yeah. should he, I mean, the way it works? Agreed. You know, but, uh, but he was Look, wasn't. I'm sorry because Vern is asking a question that's really unrelated okay. to the vows it's just a. It's he's kind of going. Well, wait a minute. How come God didn't kill right. David? Okay. It, I just wanted to separate make, the two. To make it clear that that's why it's different here. That that's you yeah. know, this is. With what d vows David made and David being vowed are two different things, but the the concept there is that you can't you know, look. It's it's she's got the 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 correct idea related to vows. You cannot pay the bail to get out a guy. That is got the death penalty. The sentence has been made. He's going on death row. He's going to die. That's it. There's no bailing him out. And the idea of this whole thing of redemption using silver, the metal of redemption, and the costliness of this redemption is what is being communicated here, but that God has made provisions for redemption. And that's the important thing because we're all foul-ups. Where, whether it is by making a vow foolishly uh, or just being deceitful, we need redemption, and God has made prov provisions for it. And it is expensive, very expensive. Now, keep in mind, we're trying to tie together our Greek church-age doctrine with uh, the Old Covenant Jewish law. And I know that you're trying to wrestle your way through that in typology. Uh, and I want to just caution you for a minute. Don't do it because we're dealing with practical, literal application. There are spiritual types that we know about redemption. We have plenty. The Lord was purchased for 30 pieces of silver, betrayed, if you will. Uh, he, if the, the silver is the metal of redemption. He paid the price to redeem us from the, the, the capture that we had uh, been given over to and to the slavery. Uh, but the direct corollary is disconnected because we're actually trying to teach man under the law that if you disobey God, it's going to be expensive. But there is redemption. That's the point that needs to be communicated under the old covenant law. The application that we keep trying to do, at least I'm feeling that that's what some of your minds are trying to do, the application is that uh, we as church age believers that make vows unto the Lord and break them, it's going to be expensive, but there is redemption. And the cost is not on the Lord, it's on you. See, if, look, I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable, but you already know if you go through a divorce, you've made a vow to be married, and you go through a divorce, it's expensive, right? If you are a person that has set uh, in your own heart and mind, I'm going to honor the Lord with the first fruits of my increase, and you decide to be stingy and selfish and keep back what you should rightly give the Lord, it's going to cost you something. Uh, in the, under the law, he, God says, prove me now and see. Uh, but in the principle, forget about the law, just in the principle, he that sows little shall reap little. Or the, if you uh, are, uh, withhold what is more than right, you shall come to poverty. Uh, these are practical verses in the Proverbs that are not related to just being under the law. And so if you're not doing as you should, it will cost you. Uh, and so... These, all these kinds of things that are communicated in the Bible tell us that we're foul-ups, but that God has a plan for our redemption. But realize the cost of disobedience. I don't know about you, but I can give you the names and addresses of I don't know how many people that I have watched sin. And when I watch them sin, I know that it will cost them. And it will cost them dearly. And it's sad. But that doesn't mean there is no hope. Amen? All right. Let me give you just a couple of quick things just as like my mental summaries and we're done. Unless you have questions. We have 10 more minutes. Uh, taking back things we give to God is costly. 
That was one of my bullets I wrote. Things that we give to God is, and taking them back is costly. Uh, taking things that belong to the, uh, think, taking that which belongs to the Lord is costly. So if something already belongs to the Lord and you take it, it's going to cost you. And then last but not least, I guess I've already covered all this. I just chicken scratched this a minute ago because I was in a hurry. Um, men are faulty and therefore God makes provision for the redemption. I've said it already, all of the above. So we got 10 minutes. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, hell, yeah. Uh, yeah, I got 10 minutes, huh? I, I guess I, when I was thinking about this, and admittedly, I have to, I, I got to tell you, I started work at 5.30 this morning, and it's been like that for the last three days. It's been go mad crazy from thing to thing to thing, and it, I was upstairs at the last minute trying to dial in some just some of this stuff, uh, which obviously is a pretty tough chapter anyway, um, but one of the thoughts that went through my mind today sometime in the midst of it all was... Uh, the cost of uh, the greater cost to redeem, uh, and of course, the first thing that went through my mind was the greatness of the co the Christ uh, the the cost that the greatness of the price Christ paid to redeem us, which was greater than our worth. You know, if you go back to you know fifty shekels, thirty shekels, fifteen shekels, whatever. Hey, he, he, he paid a price that we would never be able to pay. Greater. And this, that is why he is able to abundantly pardon. There's more than enough, etc. cetera. Uh, and so that's on the redemption side. Uh, but for the fact that there are things that belong to God that we take back from God. So if we were his, we are his creation, and we belong to him and we take ourselves from him, by not trusting him for salvation and by doing our own thing, the cost is greater than us. And that made me think about hell because a lot of people really struggle with the concept of an eternal hell because they think that if we live 70 years, 80 years, and you die a sinner, a unrepentant sinner, you should by you know, good equity, only suffer in hell for 70, 80 years. Or if you're 120 years old or 969 years like Methuselah, the maximum amount of suffering you should have should be the number of years that you rebelled against the Lord. Then it's over. It's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that hell is eternal. And so you have to ask a lot of questions about that. Now, meaning... In the economy of God, just by way of his own sovereign choice, he could say, look, this is the price. You're going to pay it forever. And if he wanted to do it that way, he's perfectly capable of doing so. But if um, everything okay over there? <laughs> uh, oh, Okay. Yeah, whatever. I'm going to pay for that for a month. <laughs> so if God sovereignly said, that's what I'm going to do, then that's what he's going to do. And it, he's God and he can do whatever he wants. However, um, it isn't just that. Let's say that you are living in rebellion against the Lord and you die in rebellion against the Lord. We have this idea that when we die we stop being rebellious to the Lord, and we don't. And so whatever we were in life, we are after. Because then God hardens our hearts to allow us to become more of what we were. And therefore, like Pharaoh, who hardened his heart, hardened his heart, hardened his heart, then God finally hardened his heart. God didn't harden his heart the first time around. Pharaoh did. 
And God only solidly committed Pharaoh to what Pharaoh already solidly committed himself to. And therefore, the person that dies doesn't repent. In fact, I, it feels like I've, this is like a deja vu for me, but um, the guy that dies and is in hell, according to the book of Revelation, along with the others, gnaw their tongues for pain in hell and curse the God who made them. They don't repent. But now, let's add another part of the costliness of rebellion. If I sin, it affects you. And so now the ripple effect of sin passes down. And so my sin affects the next guy, which affects the next guy. And you can back this all the way up to Adam and Eve. And so the costliness is greater than the crime or the, the taking of what belongs to God. So in this case, what he's saying is, look, the offering that is already sanctified is already given to me. You can't offer that to me. But if you steal that, it's going to cost you more. Uh, there is no way of you're getting out of this. Uh, what belongs to me, the tenth one going through and so forth, you're going to give them both. It's going to be a greater cost than you can imagine. And by the way, I didn't mention this already. Remember that 50 shekels, according to the sanctuary shekel, was 50 months of salary. How many people do you think in Israel had a savings account? Not that many people could afford to redeem themselves or anything else. And so they're just in big trouble. And so there's layers and layers in this. And so, but anyway, that's the thing on hell is just the greater cost. See, there, there's a greater cost than we know. And God sets the rules. And in this case, he sets the rules. The redemption price could be paid, however, in, in, for the, the souls of men, and that was paid by Jesus. And I'm glad because we had a debt that we could not pay, and he paid it for us. Amen? All right, we got two minutes. Vern? I'm going to repeat it because they can't get to you probably quick enough. All right, he's running. All right. Yeah, thanks, Shane. Kind of running. When we finally get to the eternal hell, there is no time, so there's no way you could mark off 70 years. Eternity is going to be always right now because time will be gone. That's, the, that's one of the theories be. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure where I land on that. I know that uh, Lambert Dolphin and Missler kind of popularized that idea uh, that there is no time in eternity. Um, there are some arguments on the other, uh, the other side of that. Yeah, but it always comes from man. <laughs> yeah, uh, but like, for it's example, I, I, John, saw the, the throne room and the glory of God filled and there was space. Uh, there was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. Uh, so now you've got a measure of time outside of time. Uh, you know, the eternity... Well, maybe we, that's we, the end of it. Maybe God's well, maybe. Okay. <laughs> we'll have half hour, everybody but, shut up, and then we're on. <laughs> yeah, the idea is that um, when we think of time as a created element, which it is, yeah, it's a uh, that outside of the created world, there is no time, and that's what you're after, and I get it. Yeah, and I think it'll just be right now. That you start thinking, you know, no rest, it would not that we'll need it, but uh, no day or night, all of that. In, in heaven. Yeah, it just or really in makes the new, sense. It would all the new heavens and the right new earth. Right here, right now. Happy. Yeah, yeah. so. Look forward to it. Thank you, Vern. Thank you, guys. Um, recognizing this was a little tougher passage and kind of odd uh, tonight. I have no idea where we're going to go next week. Um, some people wanted to do Deuteronomy next. And after tonight, you're probably thinking, no, anything but that. Um, I've kind of been wanting to talk to you about the judgment seat of Christ some more. Um, I keep contending with a lot of the theologians about it, and I keep getting pushback, and I want to develop it and really hammer away at it in little tiny chunks uh, Bub told me upstairs tonight he thought it was too deep a study for, um, for us to deal with in a public forum like this. Um, but if I'm not as tired as I am tonight, I might be able to pull off a little chunks at a time. So who knows what we'll do. We'll keep on moving along. 
Um, I hope you grew and understood more and more about the book of Leviticus, God's holiness, the, the sacrificial system. I personally enjoyed a lot about uh, in the learning uh, about the sacrificial system and what God uh, did in typology and how it's fulfilled in Christ. And uh, moving on, priestly garments, we covered the uh, articles of the tabernacle we covered and all their meaning. I mean, there's a lot there that we've enjoyed. And so uh, praise the Lord for his word. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this evening. We ask your blessing, your grace, your truth to be penetrating us that you would change us and challenge us from within. Allow us to retain those things, Lord, tonight that are of great value and those things that are said foolishly or otherwise uh, unnecessary, Lord, I pray that those would just fall away by the wayside. But let your word never return void as your word says it will not. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.